audits of receivables and payables. This is Ken Boyd, the owner of St. Louis Test Preparation. Here's our email address and our phone number, and you'll also see a related video on inventory in our Auditing 6, the prior video to this one. We're talking about um, first audits of receivables, and this gets back to the phrase that we used in Auditing 6, where did my cash go? If somebody uh, invests $50,000 in their Hallmark score, store, and six months later they look at their balance sheet and notice that their cash balance is much lower. The question is, where did my cash go? And the two biggest places that cash go, particularly for a retailer, is inventory, which we talked about in the last video, and then receivables right after that. So that's why we talk about these two areas, because these are the biggest areas of the audit. And we talk about, just like we did last time, what is in the audit report? What is the auditor claiming? or opining to since an audit is an opinion. Well, with receivables, they're talking about the fact that the receivable balance, in their view, is materially correct, which means that a financial statement reader would be reading a document that is accurate enough that there is no change that would affect their final decision on things. The risk to the auditor is that the value of receivables, since they're an asset, is overstated. The risk is overstating assets, including receivables. And obviously, our best verification of anything, including audit information, is from a third party, someone who is independent of the company. So now I've gone over to Excel, and we see at the top, first of all, let me go to my balance sheet. And we see here's the asset section of the balance sheet. We have a cash balance, and right after that, we have accounts receivable and inventory. And I've coded those on the right as being both big users of cash. So when we have our audit done, we want to spend enough time on receivables and inventory to find out what's going on. We also have a note payable listed here that I'll get to in just a minute. So at the top of the page, we talk about receivables. And in this case, we have a list of items. Each one's numbered. Here are the balances in receivables by person we sold to, customer, and then we have a balance in terms of dollars. And what we do is we send out something called confirmation letters. Because what we are doing is asking the customer to confirm that they exist. And specifically what we're asking the customer is, did you buy the goods that are listed on this invoice? So we're going to send John Smith a letter and we're going to ask John is it true that you bought from the plush furniture store, the customer, $400 worth of stuff? Here's a copy of the invoice. Is that the agreement as you understand it, yes or no? And they will send back verification. Another way to confirm a receivable, particularly if it's uh, a company that produces a physical good, is shipping information. Can FedEx or a, a trucking company confirm that they shipped a certain amount of Levi's jeans to the Gap store if they did we know that that was a sale for Levi's and another one is simply history if Hallmark consistently sells two hundred thousand dollars worth of merchandise at the store in suburban St. Louis and this year's financial statements show they sold hundred eighty thousand dollars worth that's somewhat consistent with their history so we look for cons consistency too and what we're trying to get at is that the receivable balance is reasonable when we look at history. So we're going to have a list of all the items and they're going to add up to that $120,000 receivable balance and we're going to agree that to the balance sheet which shows $120,000. If we flip back to payables, the payable is about what do I, the company, owe and let's talk about the audit report again. The claim in the audit report, we want it to be materially correct, which means a statement reader would be looking at information that would not change if we counted every single dollar enough for them to change their opinion of the financials. Materially correct. And the risk with the liability is that we understate them that they're too low. We want to avoid understating payables. 
Third party information again is our best evidence. And the example I have was with a bond, a bond that's been issued by the company. If you want to find out more about bond accounting, our intermediate accounting three through six videos talk about bonds, bond premiums, and discounts. So the bottom part of my Excel spreadsheet for the plush furniture store includes confirmation letters sent out on payables and we're trying to confirm with creditors, people that have lent money to the plush furniture store, how much are you owed? So for the note payable that we have on the balance sheet of $150,000, there will be a bond certificate. I made it up and said it was issued by Bank of America. It's a 10-year note payable due on this day. It has a 7% interest rate and it's payable twice a year. All the details on the bond certificate would be confirmed in writing when we send a confirmation letter to Bank America, the creditor. So that's one thing we do with payables. Are you still owed this amount is really what we're asking. We confirm all the details in the loan agreement. In this, my example I just did, that was all the detail on the bond certificate. Could be a lot, you know, other kinds of loans. It could be um, a traditional bank loan. It could be debt that was issued to the public in terms of a corporate bond. It could be uh, short-term lendings at a bank. There may be collateral involved that you have to have on deposit at the bank that would be confirmed also. But one thing that's unique with payables is, well, what about bills that are paid after the balance sheet date? After the balance sheet date. This happens to be January 30th. What if, for example, the plush furniture store had hidden a bunch of bills in a drawer? And we got, when we got done with the audit, they paid all those bills in mid-February. We would call those unrecorded liabilities as of January 30th. They were owed as of the balance sheet date, January 30th, but they weren't recorded. The problem with that is we're understating our liabilities, our payables. So one way we do that is we take a look at the checkbook after the balance sheet date to see what checks were written after we got past the balance sheet date. And if there were checks written, were the payables posted in the financials when we did our audit? That's the end of part seven. You'll see our Facebook page listed here. You can subscribe to our channel, Ken Boyd STL, all one word. <coughs> We do one-on-one -on -one live tutoring and live chat sessions. Thanks very much for listening, and we'll see you next time.